Yes, good morning. Thank you, Toro. That was wonderful. I didn't quite understand everything, but it looks like he's covered everything, right? A very, very happy welcome to all of you who traveled from near and far to be here on this 50th anniversary, a very special day. A very special welcome, as uh, Toro already mentioned. We have Pastor Ken Curtis and Lorraine here, and their ministers here. We have um, a special welcome to Pastor K uh, Kirsten, and also Ben, Pastor Ben and Nolene. Thank you for coming. It's been awesome. And Pastor Adrian, all the way from Whangarei. <laughs> also, a very special welcome to the musicians. It is so great to have um, Sulu be here on the organ. She brought it all the way from Kerry Kerry. And then her daughter Jenny and also Susanna Weber, who her and her husband passed it here for eight years. Eight years, eight years that's well, right. <laughs> well, you're still doing a fantastic job. And you're uh, Jenny, that's your daughter, right? And she's doing an absolute great job. So thank you so much for coming up to celebrate with us 50 years of Kai Koi. Uh, greetings to us all. I've been asked to pray the Lord's Prayer in Māori and um, Mariana will translate. So we'll do it in three parts, but we all know the Lord's Prayer. Uh, we'll start now. Ke ino i tātou, let us pray. E tō mātou matu i te rangi, ki a tapu tau i ngō, ki a tāmai tauranga ki ratangi, ki a mea te a tau e pai ai ki unga ki te whenua, ki a rite a ngō ki tō te rangi. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, in earth as it is in heaven. O mai kia mātou aene, he taro ma mātou mo tēnei rā. Urua o mātou hara, me mātou huki e muru nei i o te hunga e hara na kia mātou. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. Aua hoki mātou e kawea kia whakawaya, engari paka orangia mātou i te kino. Nau hoki te rangatira tanga, te kaha, me te kororia, āke, 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 āmine. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. <coughs> All right. Joe Sia couldn't read. There were no schools in his village, Sia, in Liberia. As a boy, he worked on the family rice farm. When he grew older, he married, had nine children, and still worked on the farm. He had no reason to read. One day, a Seventh-day Adventist evangelist, Willie Hilbig, arrived in the village. Joe, wasn't in, Joe, sorry, Joe was interested to learn from the Bible and he and other villagers asked the evangelists to study with them. Willie agreed, and a month later, all 50 adults in Sia and a, and a neighboring village, Diu, were baptized. <coughs> Willie, the first ordained Liberian <coughs> pastor in the Adventist church, told the new believers that, that it was their turn to spread the gospel message. 
Joe didn't want. Uh, Joe didn't. Joe didn't know what to think. He loved Jesus and wanted to share the gospel, but he was 45 years old and couldn't read. I can't open the Bible and teach from it, he said. Willie wasn't worried. He invited Joe and five other newly baptized church members to attend a Bible training school in, in Diu. On the first day of classes, Joe looked at the other five men in Willie's classroom. None of them had gone to school and none of them could read. He was in good company. While Willie, uh, Willie prayed and gave a new Bible to each man, then he opened his own Bible and showed the men how to find important verses. He read each verse out loud and explained the meaning of every word. Joe prayed earnestly. He didn't know how he would remember all the verses. He wanted to speak to others about Jesus soon coming, but he didn't know how he would ever be able to do that. Every day, Joe and the other men met with Willie to learn from the Bible. Every day, Joe prayed for the Holy Spirit to bless their classes. One day, as Willie guided the men through important verses in the Bible, Joe noticed that he had no trouble finding the verses on his own. As Willie read, he was able to follow along in his own Bible. He looked over at, the, at his classmates. They were also able to find the verses and follow along. Joe and the other men stood up and began reading the Bible out loud to the astonished evangelist. Back at home, Joe tried to read a book other than the Bible, but he couldn't do it. He found another book, but he couldn't read it either. However, he was able to read the Bible easily. Joe went on to become head elder of the first Seventh-day Adventist church established to serve Sia Village and several other villages in 1937. Although he never attended school, he energetically taught and preached from the Bible at the new church located in the village of Nusses. He died in 2003 around the age of 90. It was the work of the Holy Spirit, his son, S.E. Josiah, um, who, could, who was also a church elder. It is the Holy Spirit who gives knowledge, and he wanted the Seventh-day Adventist message to come to our region. He allowed my father to, to read the Bible. Thank you. What a beautiful story. And as we can see, we have so many different languages, and they can be translated, and it's awesome. Praise God. Thank you, Koto. Uh, uh, Pano, good to have you all here with us. And um, wow, what a beautiful day it is. Have you enjoyed the music? Yes. Awesome. Did you enjoy that young lady that was up here? Yes. All right, all right. That's good. That's my wife. Um, she does a good job. So, you know, great, great. Great to have you all here today. And, you know, we serve an awesome God because the Holy Spirit is always ahead of us, amen? amen. And uh, when they prepared this particular week's lesson, it was prepared by our General Conference Office about five years ago, and they knew that through the Holy Spirit's power that Pastor Gary must be gonna take this lesson today because he's talking about my favorite subject, personal testimony. So for those of you that have, have, uh, have read it, witnessing and personal testimony. Um, naturally, there's others who could take this lesson for us today, but, um, you're going to have to put up with me this morning. So let's just open with prayer again. Father in heaven, we just want to say thank you for your wonderful love, for the glory that you bestow upon us each day anew, for your mercy that you give us, Lord, a fresh each day new. Father, we are just so in, so full of your um, love, Lord, and we are just so grateful for the way you've worked this week with the, with the members of Kaikoui to prepare for this day. So, Lord, may your Holy Spirit just enclose us in today as we look at your word again in Jesus' wonderful name. Amen. Amen. So, if I, if I said to you, have you all got a personal testimony? Everybody should go. Yeah. Some of you have to go. No, but personal testimonies are the most powerful way to present <coughs> your story of how you came to Jesus Christ. Amen. And uh, your personal testimony is the best sermon that you can give to anybody because it's yours that happened you uh you've experienced and you can pass that good news on to, to anybody today we also have a very powerful uh, testimony with uh, um, first-time visitors here in kaikoui the uh, people that i'm talking about is edwina and joe all the way from the Tauri bay 
they actually rang Mariana one, one day and said, we, have, uh, we are so excited about watching Pastor Doug Batchelor. And I thought, well, that's awesome. They've said, we want to keep the Sabbath, we want to get baptised, and we want to come to church. So this is their first day, so welcome Edwina and Joe today. Um, is God doing a great work? Yes, he is. Is Jesus coming soon? Amen. Yes, he is. So it's just great to see him preparing so many people um, before his coming. Amen. So in this week's lesson, our memory text comes from the book of uh, Acts chapter 4 and verse 20. Acts chapter 4 and verse 20. For it says here, For we cannot but speak the things which we have seen and heard. Powerful message, isn't it? For we cannot but speak the things which we have seen and heard. When you're excited about something, what do you want to do? Share. You want to share it. You want to go and tell somebody, right? And my brother, he's, he's, a, he's a classic example of that. When he's been down the road and he's seen a particular flash car, Gary, you've got to come and check this out. That's awesome, right? And uh, if he had the money, he'd have a lot of cars in his garage. But it's because he's excited, that's the thing he enjoys, he loves to tell people about it, right? And of course, we have that beautiful saying, what your heart, what your cup is full of, it will overflow. Amen? And what your heart is full of, the, the joy of the Lord, naturally, it's going to overflow. Amen? However, sometimes we have doubt and people think, oh no, I can't really tell them because maybe they won't accept what I'm saying. Is that true? We have those feelings sometimes, right? And it is interesting because I have experienced that myself. We have been um, visiting somebody and um, Mariana knows that I love to share the beautiful gospel of Jesus Christ. And she said, how come when we came away from the particular visit, she said, how come you didn't tell those people? And I said, the Spirit told me not to. It's great when we work hand in hand with the Holy Spirit of God, because not everyone is ready to, to uh, receive the beautiful gospel message, right? And we have those warnings, uh, why and why we should and why and why we shouldn't do it. But we cannot, for we cannot but speak the things which we have seen and heard. Just as we read our first couple of paragraphs in our, in our lesson from this week, it says there in paragraph one, there is unusual power in a personal testimony. When our hearts are warmed by Christ's love and we are changed by his grace, we have something significant to say about him. It is one thing to share what Jesus has done for someone else. It is quite another to share what he has done for us personally. Amen? It is difficult to argue against personal experience, for people may debate your theology or your interpretation of a text or even scoff at religion in general. But when an individual can say, I once was hopeless, but now have hope, I was filled with guilt, but now have peace, I was um, purposeless, but now have purpose. Even skeptics are impacted by the power of the gospel. And you know, um, many of the, the church members here in Kaiko have been praying for my brother who's not well, he's got pancreatic cancer. But since he gave his life to Christ, there's a peace that has come over him and it's just amazing to, to, to witness that. If you told me 20 years ago when Mariana and I first came back to New Zealand um, that one day uh, my brother would accept Jesus Christ, I would have gone, really? But that miracle has taken place. And he said to me yesterday as we had lunch for my sister's birthday, he said, he said no, sorry, I reminded him of a statement he made to a good friend of his, um, uh, uh, Melda, uh, Les Liggett and Dargaville. He said, well, maybe I'm still alive because God wants me to witness to my family. And I reminded him of, of that yesterday. He said, yeah, it's obviously why I'm here. Praise God. Praise God. So, you know, there is never any excuses for us not to defend the love that we have for, for Jesus Christ. Another lady just this week um, from Dargaville, baptized about 80 months ago, has been diagnosed with a very, very sad sickness called Lewy body. Um, sickness, which is, when you define that, it's Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, and dementia all in one. So she's got the whole packet, right? But a beautiful lady, beautiful lady, we went to see her in hospital, and her husband tells me, tells us, um, because, you know, they're just, they're just oozing with the love of, of the Lord, these people, the personal testimony. She says to the doctor, when she first meets him, do you believe in God? 
And he says, no, sorry, I don't. He said, well, she said, well, you're no good to me. <laughs> and she said, by the way, I want a Christian nurse. And he said, well, I'll see what I can do. She looked at him and said, well, no, you're standing here. Off you go. Uh, <laughs> but that's what it's like, isn't it, when we're excited about the personal testimony that we have and experience through Jesus Christ. Even when she has to go to the convenience, a nurse has to go with her, she comes out and says to her husband, well, I was able to pray with that one too. So, again, personal testimony is a powerful, and I'm sure that we all have a personal testimony, right? And the reason why I'm excited is because, yeah, I've got to get this right, 37 years ago when this young lady came into my life, um, God saved me from the addictions that I was, uh, what was in, right? And it's amazing how he went about it in order to free me from that, from that addiction that I was stuck in, right? And um, it's only by his grace that I've received that power and, and the Holy Spirit's power to come out and be with me today. So if you said to me, if you said to me 37 years ago, thank you, David, if you said to me 37 years ago that one day I'll be pastoring the Adventist Church in Kaiko, I'd go, yeah, what drugs are you guys on? <laughs> but God's ways are not our ways, amen? And that's why we should be excited the fact that we have found, or Jesus Christ has called us, we've accepted this beautiful gift of salvation, right? And we should be telling the whole world. We should be telling the whole world. And where is our world? It's here in Taiko. It's wherever we are living. That's our world, our family. And if they say to you, nah, I'm not interested, that's okay. Because God gave you a free choice to accept him or not. Amen? Sometimes we get a bit upset, don't we, when people reject the gospel message. But look how long it took us to get there, to cross, to cross that line. Amen? All right. So let us go into our lesson and let us turn to the Gospel of Mark, chapter 5, and reading from verse 15. Mark, chapter 5, and verse 15. Again, just this here is a very, very powerful demonstration to the, to the power of, of the Holy Spirit, to the power of God. We know, we know the story, and it's about when Jesus um, crosses, crosses the sea and came to... Um, to the country of the Gajarim, and there he healed a man that was possessed, right? Possessed with demons. And we know how many they were. But let's pick up our story in um, chapter 5 of Mark, verse 15. And they came to Jesus, and they see him that was possessed with the devil and had the legion sitting and clothed and in his right mind, and they were afraid. And they that saw it told them how it how it befell to him that he was possessed with the devil, and also concerning the swine. And they began to pray him to depart out of their coast. And when he was come unto, into the ship, he that had been possessed with the devil prayed him that he might be with him. Howbeit Jesus suffered him not, but says to them, Go home to thy friends, and tell them how great things the Lord hath done for thee, and have compassion on thee. And he de departed and began to publish in Decapolis, how great things Jesus had done for him, and all men did marvel. So when we read that, how can we maybe relate that in, into our own lives? Or what, what would you say, um, or what would you give as an expression of what, what actually happened there? What do you think Jesus said to him? No, I don't want you to come with me, I want you to stay here. Any, any answers, any questions? David? The ones that saw him would be more effective than the ones that didn't know him. Very good. Okay, so the ones who saw him would be more affected by the change in the man, right? So he had a guy that's absolutely strong, breaking chains. He's, he's going around cutting himself. He looks a mess, right? And then suddenly he's peaceful, sitting at the feet of Jesus, right? So Jesus says to him, basically, he's empowered him and said, now you are my witness here in the capital. So he said, yeah, sorry. Um, um, yeah. He was also trying to get to the Pharisees and Sadducees because in those times too, when they had a healing, they had to go and get, right. um, especially for leopards and stuff, you had to go and get checked through from them. Mm -hmm. And so Christ knew that he couldn't go and witness because they were trying to kill him. So he sent those that were healed by him to them and he was able to reach them where words couldn't say. Amen. Amen. My Amen. 
there. He lived from there to be the first evangelist in the Catholics, right? And what a powerful evangelist he must have been. Right? Because um, because when when they came back years later, they found people that believed on the Lord Jesus Christ just through that man's witness. Amen. But you know, is there any difference between that occasion and our occasion? I know there's not many of you going around breaking chains lately and cutting themselves, but is there any difference? Physically, maybe not, but God has changed us also, hasn't he? Hey? When we think of the road that we were going down, turning our back on the Lord, maybe, right? And then suddenly he's turned us around. And that's why God wants us to be disciples um, here in Kaiko through the north, wherever we're, we're living, right? And the one particular verse I really, really um, uh, appreciate is found in 1 Peter. 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 15. Very similar to our opening verse today, but First Peter chapter 3, verse 15. Where it says here, But sanctify the Lord God in your heart, and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. That is such a beautiful verse. I love it. I love it. Because it says, But sanctify the Lord God in your heart. Is the Lord your God holy? Um, and, and are you in love with the Lord in your heart? Right? Because when you are, people notice that. Right? And they say, What's the difference between. Why are you different? Why are you different? It's because we have sanctified the Lord God in our hearts. And be always ready to give an answer to every man that asks you the reason of the hope, right? And again, how do we do that? How do we do that? How do we give the answer of the hope that we have? We don't go and pick up this beautiful book and use it as a hammer, but we lovingly, encouragingly wrap our arms around them and tell them about what Jesus has done in our lives. Amen? Amen. Because that is the powerful witness when people see the change in our lives. Amen. Okay, so let's just think about what we just read, sorry, in the book of Mark here, chapter 15, about um, about the um, man that was ever possessed. Is there any other thoughts on, on what we just read? And for, for those of you who know the story, is there anything else that you've gleaned uh, from that this week? Any other any other thoughts? Mark chapter five, verse fifteen. What I'm going to any other thoughts? What what really struck me is that um, it says there in verse. Oh yeah, in verse fifteen, and it says, and they came to Jesus and see him that was possessed with the devil. And had the legion sitting and clothed in his right mind, and they were afraid. Why do you think they were afraid? Any idea? Because that, that, they were scared of that Thank man you. because he showed, they were all freaked out by him because of what was going on with them. Mm -hmm. And then someone came along with more power to overcome what that man had. Very good, yeah. In other words, a whole group of them couldn't overpower him. They were thrown off by him. They couldn't chain him. And then something stronger came along and helped that man out. And they were just like, whoa, this guy must be something extra scary, if you know mm. what I mean. Yeah, yeah. yeah. No, good. Yeah. Any other thoughts on that? On those for me? There's too much for them to comprehend at that moment. Okay, too much to comprehend at that moment, yeah. Yeah. It was a pretty big occasion, wasn't it? See that crazy guy, and suddenly he's sitting at the feet of Jesus, worshiping him. Right? Yeah, they were afraid. And I think you got that comment, Jason, because that's exactly right. Nothing else would tame him except this humble man. And I guess they didn't know that this woman hurt any minute again to be that kind of man he 
yeah, good point. Yeah, they've seen the way this man has been living his life, and then suddenly he's changed, and they weren't too sure whether he's going to revert back to to his old old lifestyle, right? Yeah. Okay. Yes. Um, they <coughs> Sorry again. Why him? Yeah. All right. Have we got an answer for that, do you think? Sorry. I think, yeah, sorry. It's back there. Uh, Irina? The main reason is <coughs> That's right. That's right. And that was kind of multiplied, wasn't it, to 2,000 when you think how many went into those, went into those pigs. I think I think that's where they might have got that expression swine flu because they all swine flu down the hill. <laughs> um, yeah, but uh, they don't hold that against them. Um, yeah, amazing, isn't it? Amazing, isn't it? It's just just the power of God in that man's life. And if he, we know Jesus is able to do that to him. Can you imagine what he can do in our lives? Right? And it's funny, isn't it? But sometimes we think. Oh, no, we just take things so lightly and, and just cruise and float, right? But Jesus says we have to be born again, born again, and ready to be awaiting when he comes again. Before we just carry on with our lesson, with our, our time's going good, is there any other um, instances in Scripture whereby you'd say, yeah, that's a powerful person testimony from, from anyone in particular? We have got a couple here. While you're thinking, I'll just carry on with this um, unlikely witness. Here in um, the paragraph two down the bottom, it says, the man was whole again, physically, mentally, emotionally, and spiritually. The presence of the gospel is to restore broken people by sin to the wholeness for which Christ has created them. What better person to reach these Ten cities of Decapolis and a transport demonic who could share his testimony with the entire region. Powerful, isn't it? Powerful. Okay. Yeah. Yes, sir. What about um, Lazarus? Oh, amen. Yeah. Yeah. Once he's dead and then he's alive, right? And um, again, has to look forward to another another death. But yeah, powerful, would not it? And it would have been interesting too, wouldn't it, to see how people reacted to Lazarus, right? <coughs> You know, if there's any superstition or anything out there, they go, oh, what's going on here? But yeah, again, powerful witness. Thank you, David. Any other one? Mary Magdalene. Mary Magdalene. Yeah, amen. Beautiful testimony, isn't it? Beautiful testimony. We'll look at that too in a minute. There's someone else back there. Yeah. You look at all um, the stories that were in there, because if you follow on in that chapter, you've got um, Jarvis's daughter, you've also got the woman with the, um, the blood. And all these people knew the power of Jesus, and they needed, I mean, some of them were going to say, Lord, speak the word and they'll be healed. Amen. And some of them was just a touch. So those people then were, went out and told, some of them were told not to say anything, because it would have been harder for them to do the ministry there, but others who said go and tell, um, to depend on who he wanted to reach. But yeah, all the way through the, the New Testament, you see the power of God, <laughs> yeah, thank you, um, Ali, for that, because, you know, the one with the issue of blood is a powerful story, too, isn't it? You know? Here we have that lady who's been suffering for 14 years, and, you know, we can just try and envisage her life, you know? She must be, a, she's had this issue of blood for 14 years, she would have been emancipated, she would have been weak, right? And then she hears that Jesus is coming, and there's a big crowd following Jesus, right? And here she is, uh, and knowing in her state by the by the, the rules of the Pharisees and the Jews, that she wasn't even allowed out in public, right? But here she is, she comes out and she pushes her way through that crowd of people. Again, you know, she's she's weak. And she says, if only I can touch the hem of Jesus. If only, right? That is faith, right? Yeah, humble, right? If only. And as soon as she touched the, the hem of Jesus, Jesus then stops and then starts to use that act as a personal testimony for that lady, right? Who touched me? Right? But it's because she was made a conscious effort to touch the garment of Jesus that she was healed. How is that with us? Are we conscious about our weaknesses, our, our sicknesses, our handicaps? Are we reaching out every day just to touch the hem of Jesus? 
because there's power there. There's power there. And he says, I want you to be full of, uh, of, of joy and good health. So let us claim that promise for one another. Amen. And let's be praying for one another. And you know, my members get sick of hearing this because out there in the back room, every Wednesday is a prayer meeting, right? And um, it's amazing to see not, not less than 8, 10, 12 people at that prayer meeting. But the power and the answer to prayer that we experience there over the years is absolutely wonderful, beautiful, and all to the glory of God. You know? So for me, uh, every Wednesday before we go home, it's just lovely to experience that because I'm sometimes driving home and I don't even know I'm back in front of because I've been thinking about this the way the Lord has, uh, has been working through that evening. Okay, Monday talks about the risen Christ. Amen. <coughs> it was early Sunday morning and the two Marys hastily made their way to the tomb of Christ. They were not going to ask him for anything that could a dead man possibly give them. The last time they saw him, Jesus, his body was bloody, bruised, and broken. The scenes of the cross were deeply etched in the mind. Now they were simply doing their duty. Sorrowfully, they made their way to the lamb, oh, sorry, to the tomb, to embalm his body. The gloomy shadows of despondency engulfed their lives in the darkness of despair. The future was uncertain and offered little hope. When they arrived at the tomb, they were startled to find an empty. Let's find an empty. Sorry, Matthew records the events of that resurrection morning in these words but the angel answered and said to the woman do not be afraid for i know that you seek jesus who was crucified he is not here for he is risen. isn't that beautiful beautiful account of uh, people um, wanting to to look after their lord um, in, in his um, dying dead state right and yet she finds the angel told, tells her, I know that you see Jesus of Nazareth, but he is the same. Powerful, isn't it? What did then she do? What did then Mary, Mary do? Did she say, oh, that's fine, thank you. I just wanted to check it out. I'm going home now. She was excited that that person that she loved was no longer dead. She was excited. And as, the, as our story tells us, she said, go and tell the disciples. So she runs back to the upper room and tell, told the disciples that Jesus is alive, right? And what they do, how they respond? They didn't believe. They didn't believe. How hard can that be? And yet Jesus had told them for three and a half years that that was going to happen, right? <coughs> and it happened. And she was excited. She went away and she came back again and told them again, Jesus is risen. Powerful witness, isn't it? And I thank God today that we serve the risen Savior. Amen. Proclaiming the risen Christ. Amen. Okay, we're just going to move forward a bit now to um, to Tuesday. Or is there any other comments in regards to that one uh, about Mary um, in Matthew 28? Uh, Matthew 28. <coughs> no, we're happy with that. Okay, good. Let's go then to um, Tuesday where it says. In, uh, in the book of Acts, chapter 4, verse 30, Now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were uneducated and untrained men, they marveled and they realized that they had been with Jesus. Amen? So let's, uh, let's turn to the book of Acts, chapter 4. Acts chapter 4, reading from verse 1. And as they spoke unto the people, the priests and the captain of the temple and the Sadducees came unto him, being grieved that they taught the people and preached through Jesus the resurrection from the dead. And they laid hands on them and put them in hold into the next day, for he was now, it was now even by evening. Howbeit many of them which heard the word believed, and the number of the men were about 5,000. And it came to pass on the morrow that their rulers and elders and scribes, and Annas the high priest, and Caiaphas, and John, and Alexander, and as many as were of the kindred of the high priest, were gathered together at Jerusalem. And when they had set them in the midst, they asked, By what power or by what name have you done this? 
And then Peter, filled with the Holy Ghost, said unto them, You rulers of the people and elders of Israel, if we this day be examined of the good deed done to the impotent man, by what means, by what means he is made whole, be it known unto you all and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, even by him, that this man stand here before you whole. This is the stone which was set at naught of you builders, which has become the head of the corner. Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is no other name under heaven given among men, whereby you must be saved. How, when they saw the boldness of Peter and John, they perceived that they were unlearned and ignorant men, they marveled and they took knowledge of them that they had been with you. And beholding the man which was healed, standing with him, they could say nothing against it. And when they had commanded them to go aside out of the council, they conferred among themselves, saying, What shall we do? Uh, what shall we do to these men? For that indeed a notable miracle has been done by them is manifest to all them that dwell in Jerusalem, and we cannot deny it. But that it spread no further among the people that are straightly threaten them that they speak henceforth to no man in this matter. And they called them and commanded them not to speak at all, nor teach in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John answered and said unto them, Whether it be right in the sight of God to hearken unto you more than to God, judge ye, for we cannot but speak the things which we have seen and heard. Amen? Amen. Again, a beautiful, a beautiful um, story of uh, what's happened there to Peter and John. But what, what would you personally like to draw out of that particular reading there, a particular text? Does anything jump out at you there? A man's just been healed, right? And here we have the the, the leaders of Israel questioning them about what they've done. Okay? Anything that jumps out of it? I think when you when you start witnessing to people, you should not be surprised when you experience some kind of resistance. Yeah. Or something that will push back against you. Mm -hmm. um, I know during the honeymoon period when you're like you found Christ and it's all awesome, you're out there, and then you can get knocked at back a bit if you don't expect a little bit of the evil force to work against you. You know, it can hinder your walk for a bit. It did with me, for sure. Um, but if you know that, that that side will be trying to play against you, you can rely more on Christ and you can walk harder and further than what you, what you'd usually expect. It's something you've got to remember in your walk, hey? Mm. Yeah, no, good point, Jason. Thank you. Yeah. Anything else that jumps out of this morning? I'm not turning to this. A lot of the negative reaction was caused through jealousy mm. of, of Christ being able to heal and do and attract the crowds and mm. maybe getting left. And so the opposition came in. I was quite interested to see that that jealous word came up quite a bit. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, thank you, Sue. David? I'm just going to put on the part of uh, your old life. Yeah. Where people, your old friends, remember who you were. And they tend to uh, test you mm. and see if, hey, are you really true? Mm. You know? Is this follow of tickle or what? Yeah, amen. Yeah, no, that is so true. But no, thank you, too, for Susan for mentioning that thing that. Uh, the Pharisees and the leaders of Israel were jealous of what was actually taking place, right? Is, is, there, is there a danger for us too to also take on that same same approach as the Israelites did at that time? Not, not, not to become jealous of Jesus, but um, can we also go down a road that's very similar? Yeah, yeah. Um, considering those um, Pharisees, of course, based on fear, and it could be the same kind of fear that, that those guys had when they came and saw that fellow that, um, that was um, possessed by the demon and they finished up in swine. So this, this fellow here is going to cost them money. You know, same as where the guys were afraid of. I think that's the part we missed. Mm -hmm. that they, these, this, um, wasn't gonna, this Jesus was costing them money. Pigs, the loss of the pigs. 
um, with the with the the Pharisees, you know, they were gaining uh, Jesus was gaining momentum, and they were afraid of him. Mm. Yeah, that's what I think. Yeah. yeah. Any other other thoughts on that? Yeah. We. Yeah. Sorry. John, he was just an unfisherman, a hard man, and John had a reputation known as Sons of Thunder, and that's part of what the authorities couldn't understand. Here are these learned men sharing about the wisdom of their their Savior, and were quite knowledgeable with the Bible and the protocol, which had taken the the authorities years to learn and study. Mm. Yeah, no, thank you. Thanks for that. That's awesome. Yeah. Yeah, we, we too. We too as a church have to be careful that we don't get stuck in tradition. Right? We've got to be so careful we don't get stuck in tradition. And allow the Spirit of God to lead us. Amen? And I love that statement that we are to worship God in spirit and in truth. And, uh, yeah, and not to get bogged down with, with heavy stuff, right? Because that's where Jesus said, when you come to me, I will make you. Right? Free in the beautiful knowledge of knowing the truth and presenting the truth in the same manner that he gave it to us. Amen? Yeah, awesome. The other powerful text here is that when Peter spoke um, in verse 8, it says, And Peter, filled with the Holy Ghost, said unto them, Peter, filled with the Holy Ghost. So he was empowered um, to present this message um, to the leaders of Israel. And, um, and we too, um, you know, we have the other Bible verse, I can't remember where it is, but when we come up before um, leaders and, uh, you know, especially towards the last days, that um, it says we don't have to worry about what we have to say, right, because the Holy Spirit will give it to us. And, you know, I've experienced that on, on a personal level, too, where somebody has a particular situation um, in their household and they'll say, Pastor, um, I'd like to ask you a question about something, you know, you know just a moment. Prayer is saying, Lord, do all this prayer has got to help me give me an answer. And it's amazing every time uh, he does answer, answer that prayer. So we have nothing nothing to fear in that sense. Is that Gary? <coughs> yes, sir. Um, we have to kind of um, remember that Peter always, it seems like they always focus back on what was the most important, and that's Christ. Amen. They always centered their mind back there instead of um, sometimes we get caught up like these rulers into theological discussions which mm-hmm. we try and um, you know just make ourselves important I guess <laughs> that's right I always try to win those conversations but, but we kind of, um, mm-hmm. Peter always goes back to Jesus the, the stone that you rejected this is the foundation of our gospel where we start Amen. Yeah. So we always got to remind ourselves that it's got to go all the way back there. Yeah. Amen. Thank you for that. You know, when we think of Jesus being our corner, cornerstone, our spiritual cornerstone, he's the one that pulls us together. He's the one that pulls the church together. Amen. That's why there is, he is the cornerstone. So, yeah, that's great. That's great. Um, you know, I was just watching some uh, Hope Channel recently, and, and it was just a beautiful message that was being presented. And I became so emotional watching it. I became so emotional watching it. I said, why can't people fall in love with you? You know, why do they make it so hard for themselves? And struggle, go through all these things. And I know circumstances are out there, and there are other issues that come in, uh, into life, but it's just such a beautiful message, isn't it? You know, and to see God's calling, calling his people, because he says there in verse 12, Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. Not perhaps or maybe, but must be saved. And why why do you think that is such an important verse there? Why is that such an important verse? Because there is no other name, okay? right? And he deserves all the credit. Jesus, the Creator, deserves all the credit, you know? And growing up as a Catholic, and no, no, no offence to anyone who is it, from the Catholic faith here today, but it was most probably because I wasn't having my ears open back then, I don't know. But I never understood growing up that Jesus was the Creator God. I always thought it was God the Father, right? But 
John 1, 3 is very clear on that, that nothing was made that was made except through Jesus Christ. And when you understand that, when you understand that principle, then you know why Jesus took on the full responsibility to go to the cross. Because no one else could have paid the cross. And he took it all upon himself to pay that price for each other. That's why there is no other name. There is no other name. And now we come into discussions with many people from other faiths, and I'm going, wow, they're so studied people sometimes. How come they can't see it? They just can't see it. But God's given us a job to be as witnesses. And again, verse 13, there was something, there was a boldness about Peter and John, right? But it wasn't that hard boldness, that critical boldness, right? It was that loving boldness of explaining to them simply the love of Jesus Christ. And that's our testimony too. And Eric, yeah. just another point. Thank you. Really? Yeah. Sorry, mate. And you are? Just, um, what do you call it? You know, Jesus tells the thing of the best man to go home to your friends and tell them, you know, what he has done for him. Mm. And then Peter and them in that in Acts and that says, um, but we cannot speak the things which we have seen and heard. So there must be an experience with Jesus, you know, that you can only tell others what you have experienced. Mm -hmm. and, and if you don't, if you're only getting it from someone else and repeating someone else's sermon, you, you haven't seen it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's really experience. <laughs> and once you experience it, like you said, the cup will overflow. Mm -hmm. It becomes natural and it becomes even more exciting. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. No, thank you. That is so true, isn't it? Amen. Mm -hmm. What your cup is full of will overflow. Mm -hmm. okay. I just got a beautiful text and I've said it before and I'll be uh other times for me that it's in Peter first and that's what we are, but you are the chosen generation, a royal priesthood of mm -hmm. holy nations, a peculiar people, that you should show forth the praises of him who has called you out of the darkness into the marvelous light. Mm -hmm. It is so much in, in, in this, this one verse, you know, we are precious to him, we have everything for, uh, that we get saved, right? Mm -hmm. Amen. So true, thank you. Yeah. Okay, um, it's time to move on. You know, I'd just like to mention that we have the story uh, in Acts 26 of Paul standing before King Agrippa. For those of you who know the story, is there any comments um, from that particular story that comes out or that you'd like to share with us this morning? Okay, we have Paul standing before King Agrippa. Here, speaking directly to the king, it says in our lesson, Paul gave his own personal testimony. He talked about his life, not only as a, as a persecutor of Jesus' followers, but also after his conversion of his life as a witness to Jesus about the promise of the resurrection of the dead. When Paul was converted on the Damascus Road, our Lord spoke to him and said, I have appeared to you for this purpose, to make you a minister and a witness, both of the things which you have seen, and of the things which I will yet reveal to you in Acts 26. What, how do you find that story of when, when Paul was on his road to Damascus for the purpose to kill other, other Christian followers, right? And then suddenly Jesus appears to him in that very bright light. What, what, what do you think about the comment that Paul made um, when, uh, when Jesus came to him? Or when, when that, that occurrence took place? You know the no the story then? Yeah. X twenty six if you're not familiar with. Because here we have we have Paul who's persecuting the Christians, right? And he's on his way to continue that that journey. And uh, I'll pick up the story here. In verse 12, okay, of chapter 26, where it says, Whereupon, as I went to Damascus with authority and commission from the chief priest, at midday, O king, I saw in the way a light from heaven above the brightness of the sun shining round about me 
and them which journeyed with me. And when they were all fallen to the earth, I heard a voice speaking unto me and saying in the Hebrew tongue, Saul, Saul, why persecute thou me? It is hard for thee to pick against the brick. And I said, Who art thou, Lord? And he said, Isn't that an amazing statement from Paul? Suddenly this, this huge event just takes place on the road to, to Damascus. I haven't had anything of since traveling to Glyco. But. And then he was so blinded from what he was doing, he did not know Jesus, he never had a personal relationship with Jesus. And right. that's why he persecuted the followers of Jesus and killed the tens of all the life because of Jesus opening his eyes. Okay, so Miriam says he doesn't didn't have a relationship with Jesus. He was a Jew and a Roman, right? And and, and uh, he's he's been given the order by the, the Jewish leaders to go and kill the Christians, right? And he's going out there with fervor and power and, and just doing his job. But when when this light appears to him and his voice from heaven coming, he says, Who art thou, Lord? Isn't that amazing that he recognizes that the Lord was speaking to him? Right? He'd heard about Jesus, right? Maybe he'd been around at, at, the, at the crucifixion, I'm not too sure. But um, all of a sudden he says, who, who are you, right? Because he knows that no one else could do something like that. It's only by the power of God that suddenly a bright light um, can shine, shine from heaven. And Jesus says, I am Jesus whom thou persecutest, but rise and stand upon thy feet, for I have prepared thee unto thee for this purpose, to make thee a minister and a witness in both of these things which thou hast seen and of those things in which I will appear unto thee, delivering thee from the people and from the Gentiles, unto whom now I send thee to open their eyes and turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God that they may receive forgiveness of sin and an inheritance among them that are sanctified by the faith that is in them. That's so powerful, isn't it? So Jesus personally gives him the job to go and be a minister and do all these things for him. So it's a total turnaround for Paul and he's now a minister for but the key thing with that, he also goes about that work with the same fervor and determination as he did before with his other job. Amazing, isn't it? Amazing. Eric, yes, sir. Jason, sorry. It's quite interesting how <clears throat> he was saying that beforehand he knew all about the stories. Yes. Like he knew he, he knew it entirely. Mm -hmm. And he was saying to Agrippa, you know too, you know all the prophet's stories. Yes, he has. But what we were missing, what we what I was missing and what you need. Is a personal relationship with the main character of the story, Amen. Yeah. and that changes it. It changed everything for Paul. Yeah. It really did. So yeah, I can see that how that applies to now. Like, it's all good to know the stories of the Bible, but we really have to have a personal relationship with the main character, Amen. and that will transform our testimony. Amen. Mm -hmm. Well, beautiful. Right, team, we're coming to an end now, but I just want to close with this. Particular the verse of found in Matthew, Matthew 28, because as we've all received the, um, or experienced, sorry, the testimony of Jesus Christ, this is what he's saying to each and every one of us, right? So Matthew 28, and we know it as the Great Commission, even then the eleven disciples went away to Galilee to the mountain where Jesus had appointed them. And when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. And Jesus came and spoke unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth, Go you therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the world. So brothers and sisters, that's your job. That's what Jesus has commissioned you to do, because you have such a powerful uh, testimony, and I just pray that your cup is full. And that will overflow to Jesus. Amen. Let us close with prayer. Father, we are just so grateful. So grateful for your word, Lord, because it is a light unto our path. Amen. We just thank you, Lord, that you've given us this freedom and understanding your word, Lord, and that we can live our lives in accordance to your will without any worries. So, Father, we thank you that you promised that uh, you will be with us until the very end, and we thank you for that beautiful hope that we have. So, Lord, just anoint our congregation today afresh as we recommit our lives to you in Jesus' name.
because we want Jesus to come, right? Thank you, Pastor Gary. Awesome lesson. And we have the musicians come up again, and we sing 476 Burdens Are Lifted at Calvary. 476 Burdens Are Lifted at Calvary. Okay, just have a bit of a break. Thank you.